Hi, again, here we are, Terry Pratchett, We Free Men, Tiffany Aiken series. Um, last time we had, we were with Tiffany when she, when we, and can you remember they were in the Queen's world and the fear suddenly gripped her and then all of a sudden she woke up in her bed at the farmhouse and she thought it was, it had all been a dream about the We Free Men, but then her mum was washing up and she turned around and she was a bit of a, a nightmare monster wasn't she so actually the queen had done something to tiffany and got into her head but the pixies surged past her in a flurry of snow she looked up at the thing's tiny black eyes the scream came from somewhere deep inside there was no second thought no first thought just a scream it seemed to spread out as it left tiffany's mouth until it became a black tunnel in front of her and she fell into it as she heard in the commotion behind her who do you think you're looking at pal cravens but you're gonna get such a kick in do you remember okay here we go <clears throat> excuse me Tiffany opened her eyes. She was lying on damp ground in the snowy, gloomy wood. Pixies were watching her carefully, but she saw there were others behind them staring outwards into the gloom amongst the tree trunks. There was stuff in the trees, lumps of stuff. It was grey and hung there like old cloth. She turned her head and saw William standing beside her, looking at her with concern. That was a dream, wasn't it? She said. Well, no, said William, it was, and there again it was, nay. Tiffany sat up suddenly, causing the Pictsies to leap back. But that thing was in it, and then you all came out of the oven. She said, you were in my dream. What is, what was that creature? William the Gonigal stared at her as if trying to make up his mind. That was what we call a drome, he said. Nothing here really belongs here, remember. Everything is a reflection from outside or something kidnapped from another world. Or maybe something the Quinn has made out of magic. It was hiding in the trees and you was going so fast you didn't see it. You can spiders? Of course. Well, spiders spin webs. Drones spin dreams. It's easy in this place. The world you come from is nearly real. This place is nearly unreal. So it's almost a dream anyway. And the drone makes a dream for you with a trap in it. If he eats anything in the dream, you'll never want to leave. He looked as though Tiffany should have been impressed. What's in it for the drone? She asked. It likes watching dreams. It has fun watching you have fun. And it'll watch you eating dream food until you're starved to death. Then the drone will eat you. Not right away, of course. It'll wait until you've gone a wee bit runny because it has no teeth. So how can anyone ever get out? Oh, the best way is to find the drone, said Rob anybody. It'll be in the dream with you in disguise. Then you just gives it a good kick in. By kicking, you mean chopping its head off usually works. Now, Tiffany thought, I am impressed. I wish I wasn't. And this is fairyland, she said. Aye, you could have seen it's in a bit the tourists didn't see, said William. And you did well, ye were fighting it. You knew it wasn't it right. Tiffany remembered the friendly cat and the fallen shepherdess. She'd been trying to send messages to herself. She should have listened. Thank you for coming after me, she said meekly. How did you do it? Ah, oh, we can generally find a way into anywhere, even a dream, said William, smiling. We're a stealing folk, after all. A piece of the drone fell out of the tree and flopped onto the snow. One of them won't get me again, said Tiffany. I, I believe you. You have murder in your eyes, said William, with a touch of admiration. If I was a drone, I'd be pretty fearful, nay, if I had a brain. There'll be more of them, mark ye, and some of them are cunning. The Queen uses them as guards. I won't be fooled. Tiffany remembered the horror of the moment when the thing had lumbered around changing shape. It was worse because it was in her house, her place. She'd felt real terror as the big shapeless thing crashed across the kitchen, but the anger had been there too. It was invading her place. The thing wasn't just trying to kill her, it was insulting her. William was watching her. Hey, you're looking mighty fierce, he said. You must love your wee brother to face these monsters for him. And Tiffany couldn't stop her thoughts. I don't love him. I know I don't. He's just so sticky and can't keep up and I have to spend too much time looking after him. And he's always screaming for things. I can't talk to him. He just wants all the time. But her second thinking said, he's mine, my place, my home, my brother. How dare anything touch what's mine? She'd been brought up not to be selfish. She knew she wasn't, not in the way people meant. She tried to think of other people. She never took the last slice of bread, but this was a different feeling. 
She wasn't being brave or noble or kind. She was doing this because it had to be done, because there was no way that she could not do it. She thought of Granny Aching's light weaving slowly across the downs on freezing, sparkly nights, or in storms like a raging war, saving lambs from the creeping frost or rams from the precipice. She froze and struggled and tramped through the night for idiot sheep that never said thank you and will probably be just as stupid tomorrow and get into the same trouble again, and she did it because not doing it was unthinkable. There had been a time when they met the peddler and the donkey in the lane. It was a small donkey and could hardly be seen under the pack he had piled on it, and he was thrashing it because it had fallen over. Tiffany had cried to see that, and Granny had looked at her and then said something to thunder and lightning. The peddler had stopped when he heard the growling. The sheepdogs had taken up position on either side of the man so that he couldn't quite see them both at once. He raised his stick as if to hit lightning and thunder's growl grew louder. I'd advise you not to do that said Granny. He wasn't a stupid man. The eyes of the dogs were like steel balls. He lowered his arm. Now, throw down the stick, said Granny. The man did so, dropping it into the dust as though it had suddenly grown red hot. Granny Aiken walked forward and picked it up. Tiffany remembered that it was a willow twig, long and whippy. Suddenly, so fast that a hand was a blur, Granny sliced it across the man's face twice, leaving two long red marks. He began to move and some desperate thought must have saved him because now the dogs were almost frantic for the command to leap. Hurt done it, said Granny pleasantly. Now, I knows who you are and I reckon you knows who I am. You sell pots and pans and they ain't bad as I recall, but if I put the word out, you'll have no business in my hills, be told. Better to feed your beast than whip it. Do you hear me? With his eyes shut and his hands shaking, the man nodded. "'That'll do,' said Granny Aiken, and instantly the dogs became once more two ordinary sheepdogs who came and sat either side of her with their tongues hanging out. Tiffany watched the man unpack some of the load and strap it to his own back and then, with great care, urged the donkey on along the road. Granny watched him go while filling her pipe up with Jolly Sailor. Then as she lit it, she said, as if the thought had just occurred to her, "'Them as can do has to do for them as can't, and someone has to speak up for them who has no voices.' Tiffany thought, is this what being a witch is? It wasn't what I expected. When do the good bits happen? She stood up. Let's keep going, she said. Aren't you tired? said Rob. We're going to keep going. Aye, well, she's probably headed for a place beyond the wood. If we didn't carry it, it'll take us a couple of hours. I'll walk. The memory of the huge dead face of the drone was trying to come back into her mind, but fury gave it no space. Where's the frying pan? Thank you. Let's go. She set off through the strange trees. The hoof prints almost glowed in the gloom. Here and there, other tracks crossed them. Tracks that could have been bird's feet, rough round footprints that could have been made by anything. Squiggly lines that a snake might make, if there were such things as snow snakes. The Pixies were running in line with her on either side. Even with the edge of the fury dying away, it was hard looking for things that with here without her head aching. Things that seemed far off got closer too quickly. Trees changed, sh changed shape as she passed them. Almost unreal, William had said. Nearly a dream. The world didn't have enough reality in it for distances and shapes to work, probably. Once again, the magic artist was painting madly. If she looked hard at, it, at a tree, it changed and became more tree-like and less like something drawn by Wentworth with his eyes shut. This is a made-up world, Tiffany thought almost like a story. The trees don't have to be very detailed because who looks at trees in a story? She stopped in a small clearing and stared hard at a tree. It seemed to know it was being watched and it became more real. The bark roughened, the proper tr twigs grew on the end of the branches. The snow was melting around her feet too. Although melting was the wrong word, it was just disappearing, leaving leaves and grass. If I was a world that didn't have enough reality to go around, Tiffany thought, then snow would be quite handy. It doesn't take a lot of effort. It's just white stuff. Everything looks white and simple, but I can make it complicated. I'm more real than this place. She heard a buzzing overhead and looked up. And suddenly the air was filling with small people, smaller than a feagle with wings like dragonflies. There was a golden glow around them. Tiffany, entranced, reached out a hand. 
At the same moment, what felt like the entire clan of Nakmak Fiegel landed on her back and sent her sliding into a snowdrift. When she struggled out, the clearing was a battlefield. The Pictsies were jumping and slashing at the flying creatures who were buzzing around them like wasps. As she stared, two of them dived on to rob anybody and lifted him off his feet by his hair. He rose in the air, struggling and yelling. Tiffany leapt up and grabbed him around the waist, flailing at the creatures with her other hand. They let go of the picked sea and dodged easily, zipping through the air as fast as hummingbirds. One of them bit her on her finger before buzzing away. Somewhere a voice went, Ura! Rob struggled in Tiffany's gri grip. Quick, put me down, he yelled. There's gotta be poetry! <laughs> Next chapter is called Lost Boys. Do you think Wentworth is one of the Lost Boys? And don't I remember from early on in the story, didn't, you know, the Baron from where um, Tiffany lives, from the chalk, didn't the Baron's son go missing as well? So maybe he is in the same place with Wentworth. I'm just guessing here. And maybe Tiffany will find Wentworth and the Baron's son taken back and be well rewarded. Hmm. 